And these are, this will be pretty straightforward, hopefully. So with neutrals, you know, these are our goods. We don't care how much we have. And if, if one of the commodities is a good and the other one is, is a neutral, then we're just going to spend all of our money on the good. We're going to buy no neutrals and spend the entire budget on the commodity, which is a good. So that's what we do if there were neutrals. With bads, not surprisingly, we'd spend no money on bads. Bads are things that we don't like consuming, and we have a budget. We're not going to spend any money on those things that we don't like. So again, we'll spend no money on bads uh, in all on a commodity, which is a good. If it is a good. So the other commodity is a good, we'll spend all of our money on that. So for example, if good one um, is a bad and good two is a good, well this is going to mean we're going to spend X2 star, I guess in this case, is going to be worse than our entire budget on that. So we could afford M over P2 a bit. Good one is a bad. We're not going to spend any money on a bad one. We waste our money on something that we don't like. So hopefully these are, are fairly straightforward. Now let's you know quickly talk about discrete and, and what happens when there's um, a concave um, in different curves. We're talking things like the first couple of videos that it got me mid-sentence. There's like a delay before it says start and then, and then it goes. So apologies that the first video is uh, kind of start mid-sentence. I don't think they cut off, cut off anything important, really. Um, all right, so let's talk about discrete goods now. So let's pretend good one is discrete and good two is um, kind of like everything else, one of those composite goods, right? Money spent on everything else. So that's how we're thinking about it. Good one is some discrete good that we can only buy, you know, one and then two or three. We can't buy a continuous amounts of these goods. And we're gonna have good two is just kind of this composite good where it's money spent on everything else. Well, if you want to solve for this, all we have to, you know, we can just find out all these discrete points and, and their utility and then basically compare the bundles. So, can simply compare the bundles. And if it's discrete, that means, you know, we shouldn't have that many different combinations of bundles because, you know, kind of talked about, if, you know, we're having 49 or 50 of a good, we kind of can assume it's kind of continuous, where, where maybe it's a discrete good and we're going to have a small amount of it, like one car or two cars or three cars, if you have a car, or zero cars, um, then, then we might, it might be important to, to capture that discrete nature of the good. So here we can simply compare, you know, here's this first one where we buy, you know, one of good one, and this is how much money we have left over just, you know, as income to spend on everything else. The other option to have two, like let's say cars, and then our budget minus two times the price of cars is the money we have to spend on everything else. And so on and so forth. We can just simply compare all these bundles and see which one gives us a, a higher utility, you know, using any of those monotonic transformations of, of these utility functions we're going to use. We could also use the indifference curve, but again, we're just finding the point along the highs indifference curve. But remember, it's just a discrete set of points when we have a discrete good. So the other thing we could have is concave preferences. And here the bundle will always be a corner solution. 
or boundary possible. Or corner solution or choice, boundary choice. And so we can see that, I think, hopefully uh, fairly easily. We have concave preferences, so they look something like, like this. And what we're going to do is we're going to you know, find the highest point, our, the highest difference curve we can afford, given our budget constraint, which is beyond, again, on this boundary where we point Z, for instance, where we're spending all of our money on X1. So x1, x1 star equals m over p1, and here x2 star equals 0. It could also be that we spend all of our money in x2 and, and no, none of our money on x1 if, if the preferences looked a bit different. Or, or sorry, not the preferences looked different, but if the slope of the budget line was different. Um, notice that you know, we can afford this point, like x, for instance, or you know, we can also think about another indifference curve that looks like that, and we have this point here. But this point isn't optimal, right? We're not on the highest indifference curve we can be, even though we have this tangency point here. We need to, we need to be consuming at this point to be at our, our highest indifference curve. So anyway, it will always be a um, a corner solution if we have concave preferences. Whether that's all of good one or all of good two, that depends on, on the preferences and like the slope of this budget line, but it will be a corner solution. So you know we're gonna derive these demand functions when we get to the appendix. Um, well, I'm just gonna state them now and we'll show how we get them when we get to the appendix in a portion of, of the lecture here. So we will derive the demand functions later this chapter. But they are. So let's just state them here, and I'll show you how we get them in a bit. Well, we're going to use calculus to, to derive these in a, in a, in a few minutes here. They turn out to be C over C plus D, M over P1 for X1, and X2 is D over C plus D times M over uh, P2. And remember, this is the function X1 to, to the C and X2, oops, X2 to the D. Remember, this is the preferences here. This was the utility function, was got us this. So these preferences are going to have a convenient property. I kind of hinted at this before. These preferences have a convenient property. So if we are consuming X1 units, a good one, and X2 units, a good two. This represents P1, X1 over M as a fraction of income spent on good one and P1, sorry, P2 over X2 over M is the fraction of income on good two. Now I'm going to quickly erase this board and we're going to kind of substitute these demand functions into the fraction of income we're spending on each good, and we're going to get a nice, simple expression. Just put down what we're going to drive later for, for good, good one was going to be C over C plus D times um, M over P1. 
then we talked about how P1 X1 over M was the fraction of income spent on good one. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this demand function here and plug it into here and we can and it's going to simplify it, a nice easy expression that we can interpret very easily. So P1 X1 over M equals P1 over M times separating this part and I'm just going to plug in what x1 equals, which is c over c plus d times m over p1. And we can see this is going to simplify like really easily because these two terms are, are going to cancel out, right? So we can see that c over c plus d is the fraction of income that we're spending on good one. Here, the consumer spends a fixed fraction of their income on good one. And we could do the same for good two, and we get for good two, we get D over C plus. So again, a fixed fraction. And so if you remember, if we have x1 sorry, to the c and x2 to the d, we can use a monotonic transformation to get x1 to the a, x2 to the 1 minus a. And remember, these represented the same preferences because it was a monotonic transformation. right? So now you can think of interpreting a. Now our exponents add up to 1, essentially, right? Um, so now A is the fraction of income on good one. And then 1 minus A would be the fraction of income on good two. So this is kind of a nice property. So essentially with Cobb-Douglas, we're kind of spending a fixed fraction of our income on each of the goods.